Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. It is the moon that marks the changing seasons, governing the times, their everlasting sign. From the moon comes the sign for festal days, a light that wanes when it completes its course. The new moon, as its name suggests, renews itself. How marvelous it is in this change, a beacon to the hosts on high shining in the vault of the heavens. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio, and I thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. I'm honored to have a special guest with me this evening, both uh, Diane and Denny Culver. Diane, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Hi. Danny, are you there, brother? I'm here. All right. Welcome. And thank you both for taking the time to join us this evening. It is the vernal equinox. And for uh, most calendars, whether you follow the lunar or the solar calendar, it marks the, the beginning and the first day of spring. And on uh, God's calendar, the seasons are progressed in linear, so spring summer, fall, and winter, and we have the the vernal equinoxes and the solstices marking the beginning and the changings of those seasons. But Diane is the author, and I did post a link in the chat room for those uh, that would be later interested. She is the author of Yahweh's Unique Timepiece Explained. And so this evening we're going to be speaking about the calendar and uh, why it is, and through her thorough research and study, why it is that both she and I and Denny adhere to um, a lunar calendar that has its phases and also the festal days, as it says in that particular quote, determined by the phases of the moon. And I do believe that God established in the heavens, If he, even if we did not have a written um, calendar, that if you were to follow even the patterns, the changings of the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars, that there's a greater calendar written into the heavens uh, according to the movements and the phases and the cycles of the luminaries. And so, Diane, if you would, can you talk a bit about your book? And also, uh, for those that don't know, you can find it at sacredwordpublishing.com and do you have a separate website or uh, anything that you'd like to share like a YouTube channel or Facebook anything of that nature um, yes Denny did set up a, a website it's called uh, the repairer of the breach dot org um, that's where we first started putting anything out we let that you know, had that before my book ever got finished, um, and then he put it on there for a while. Um, our email is isa5812 at wildblue.net, <clears throat> which stands for Isaiah 5812. And those are the two different ones that we have connected with the, all the, the research that we have done. Um I guess, uh, would it be appropriate for me to kind of tell how we got into this? Oh, yeah, most um, certainly. We have plenty okay. of time, so, yeah. 
Okay, before I get into my book or anything, um, yeah, sure. we were first okay. We were first challenged with the idea of the Sabbath being connected with the moon in 2011, and it was at a meeting in a church with a guest speaker, and he didn't really say too much about it because when he started speaking about it, his wife got a little nervous, so he stopped. Um, I, she <laughs> probably thought he was stepping up a little bit too fast there. And, but uh, we meet with a small home type group and one of the members invited uh, these two different men to tell us more about it. And so we met there and uh, actually we were kind of going there to try and disprove it because naturally we weren't in it then and thought that can't be, you know. Yeah, that. I have something kind of humorous about that. Uh, I get very zealous about the scripture and since we've studied it for years. And I had my Bible, and I was going there for bear to prove that the lunar Sabbath was wrong because of the counting of the Omar. And it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't seem like it fit Leviticus 23 at all. And so I was, I was very upset in prayer mm -hmm. going there to disprove these guys. And I kind of got turned around. I, I started uh, studying the scripture and now, of course, we use the counting of the Omar as proof. Yes. If you take the exact words of the scripture as proof that it could only happen with the lunar Sabbath. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. It was right. Yeah. And it was then that we felt that the subject warranted more investigation. And that started us down the road to researching it. Uh, the people in our group asked us to look into it and then present our findings at one of our meetings. However, when we brought this info, we had begun to find it was received like we had the plague. <laughs> um, they were having a real tough time with it. Um, and some of them were looking at a lot of the negative stuff at the time that was at that time. I mean, in 2011, there was so much negative coming against Lunar Sabbath um, that they got kind of overtaken with it. Um, needless to say, we found our, our presence uncomfortable to them, and they asked us to leave. <laughs> um, but we did. But not really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we did this. This is part of our family and community here, and we did continue both Sabbaths for two years before we were asked to leave. We never talked about it or brought it up, but the rub was there of how we believed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we continued our digging for evidence. Um, at times it was very frustrating for me because it's a subject that both Christianity and Judaism has ignored. So finding info was not easy. Um, actually, it was very discouraging at times. Um, I would put it aside for a break and start looking at other interesting items articles online just saying father if this is real then you've got to open it up because i don't know where to begin to look for it but i want to find out i want to prove it one way or the other so i can either set it aside or follow what what is the tr truth right. um and so i'd look at articles online and a certain uh phrase in our Articles would stand out at me, and I would check it out, and there would be another little nugget of information heading right, right towards a, a lunar Sabbath. And it's like, well, that came out of nowhere. And I know it was him showing me, Diane, it's all over. It's just been hidden. People have set it aside because the calendar we follow has been in service for so long. It only takes about, what, 20, 30 years before people say it's always been done this way. Mm -hmm. And you're talking back in you know the 1500s when the Gregorian calendar was set up, and the Julian calendar was back, back in the time of Julius Caesar. So we've had an awful lot of time of burying all that in history. But there are things you know I found a lot of them uh, that that pointed to that. Did you want to say anything else? Or? No, you're doing no. Good. <laughs> um, with my book, I started out with a book. In fact, I, that's the book that I sent you to start out with, um, of trying to get all the information together and put it in one thing and start passing it out to different groups to get them to at least look 
at the information that I found because I had found an awful lot of different, um, not uh, historical, yeah, historical things um, in different um, encyclopedias, in Jewish writings, in Christian uh, writings and stuff that talked about it. Uh, but again, it was one of those things that you just kind of get shut down on, except you, you wanted to know about it, <laughs> which was very refreshing. Um, <laughs> most of them, you know, weren't interested in it. In fact, they said, what are you trying to do, do split the church even further? And I thought, well, you know, Yeshua said, I do not come to bring peace, but a sword. Uh, his ways are going to bring that, is going to bring division. If you follow the truth, it is not you. Unity. It, it's unity if you're all in that truth together, but it's not unity if you're not wanting to hear it. It's going to cause division. And that's what we found a lot about. And uh, with this one that I, I finally have finished, um, it's really a collection of where I started going through with different questions or statements or arguments that people will bring out. Well, what about this? Well, then you've got Shavo. Well, so I started writing small parts, and these are on our website, and then I collected them all and put them into this one book so that they were all in one place. And I had one where I just got fed up with people saying that, well, she doesn't have enough information, so I wrote, just give me the facts, please. And that is nothing but but uh, quote after quote after quote after quote. <laughs> you know, to say, okay, uh, can you tell me, how can how can you say that I haven't done my homework? If you're not even going to bother looking at it, then, you know, don't even go there because you're you're causing you're causing other people to stumble. But that doesn't matter. You know that <laughs> if people have an argument, they're going to stick to it, even if they don't want to study it. So um, for several years, we had uh, a booklet, which I think you got in. Right. Thanks to you. This really didn't get out until Sacred Word Publishing was was willing to print this and we're very thankful for that we're getting responses now from people that are just opening up to the idea and they say they're devouring diane's book uh it's difficult when you've got cognitive dissonance in your own belief box it's difficult to accept something that's new and we have found that uh we we even put her booklet before we publish this book out to Torah teachers, and they were very adamant against it, saying, how many ways are you going to divide the body of Christ? And it, it is very, very divisive, but uh, the truth is many times, and this has been Absolutely. hidden for seventeen, at least 1,700 years, so the enemy just does not want, he, he's got all kinds of reasons to keep it squelched. Right. So... Right. And the other thing um, for the the listening audience, uh, Diane is also working on another book where she's bringing forth how the mainstream churchianity, Christianity are involved in several ways in idolatry. And this certainly yeah. the calendar issue is one of those things. And so, in my opinion, truth is absolutely important, especially when you see laid out in the 10th Ten Commandments, you know, that God tells us not to take any other gods or any idols before him, and I think that yeah. calendar issue is one that uh, gives worship to Satan as the sun god, you know, and then yes. the whole, as far as that particular cosmology, and so, and then the other thing is to honor the Sabbath. Well, how can you honor the Sabbath if you don't know how to determine when Sabbath occurs? And so, and then the yeah. other, the Levitical feast days. And so what we are talking about with regard to the calendar issue, in my opinion, is absolutely critical uh, because it's only in understanding truth in the way that God has encoded into the heavens this calendar system for uh, determining his signs, his seasons, his moedim, his appointed times, uh, so that you can correctly honor, revere, and worship him according to the mandates that he gave Israel. And so um, if you don't know, well, in my opinion, I would hope that you would at least be interested to to want to know. But I yes. do discover that most people 
when it comes to truth, they're not really interested in truth, but only are interested in learning about what they think they already know. They're seeking confirmations along those kind of lines rather than, you know, uh, having or being challenged according to uh, their indoctrination and what they hold as majority opinion. And so uh, yeah. I want to read really quick and then we'll go back to you, Diane. Uh, for those that don't know, Isaiah 58, 12, it says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of past to dwell in. And I think that's yeah. a, you know, a, a beautiful quote because certainly what you are doing with your work in this particular book and the one that is uh, uh, upcoming is restoring the old ways and the traditions, uh, how it used to be, you know, because everything has now become so lost with regard to truth. And people are led astray to the point where they are involved in idolatry without even understanding it. And that's why yes. we see in Revelation 12, it says that that old serpent, that ancient dragon who deceiveth the whole world, that certainly um, yes. that is the, the state of what we are dealing with. Uh, and so let me turn it back over to you again, Diane. And, um, and so the importance of this issue and just how it was that you were able to come together and because you know god when he wants to lead you to truth he gives you confirming witness after confirming witness and i see yes. in your work that you know you have numerous hundreds of sources from various different uh, accounts and so can you share some of those things um, sure. Um, what I first want to do is there's a, a chapter I have that's called You Want Answers. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I have a list of the, the main points that people have a tendency not to think about. And I'm just going to go through that that one thing. Right. It's um, I, I based it after a movie from the 90s, A Few Good Men. I don't, I don't know if anybody uh, recognizes the title mm -hmm. of that, but there's a part in there where the witness says, you want answers? And the lawyer says, I want the truth. And the witness says, you can't handle the truth. Right. And, and I thought that's, you know, I know that I think uh, Rob Skeeter uses that one, too, because it is just so poignant. That's that's right. People say, no, I want the truth. And no, you can't handle the truth. If you could handle the tr truth, then you would research. You would look at it. You would stop doubting and putting your opinions in there. And you would actually be a Berean and look. Yeah. Look, look for the truth. Don't, don't look for opinions that match what you already believe. Um, like I, I have number one, the Roman, which is the Julian or Gregorian calendar, is not Yahweh's calendar. It is pagan. Yahweh gave us only one calendar, not two, and is based on the sun, moon, and stars. That's according to Genesis 1.14. All his appointed times are on his calendar. Using the Roman calendar to determine any of Yahweh's appointed times is mixing with pagan practices. The present Jewish calendar has been corrupted since the destruction of the temple. The time frame of the calendar metamorphosis was during the 2nd to 4th century. Because of the mixing of two calendars, band-aids have been put on the Jewish calendar to try to fix the discrepancies of clashing feasts, i.e. Day of Atonement and the Sabbath day, such as rules of postponements, delaying new moon, establishing fences, and ignoring the actual sighting of the sliver of the moon. Yahweh's day does not start at the beginning of darkness. He called the light good. Never does he call darkness good. Day is continuously spoken of before night in scripture. The beginning of the month is, to be, is determined by the appearance of the new sliver of the moon the evening before, not the astrological molad of conjunction, which is the dark moon. Following a constant Saturday Sabbath appears simple. However, it becomes complicated when it collides with the instructions in Scripture in following the feasts. 
Once you understand Yahweh's calendar, it remains simple. Determining the day of the Hebrew Sabbath in B.C. and 1st century A.D. using a pagan Roman historian who hated the Jews in the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. and he knew Saturday was the first day of the week is like determining the day Yeshua was crucified by going back in time with the modern Roman Gregorian calendar, which, by the way, is pagan and not created until the 16th century A.D. Now, those are the, the things that I start people out on to think about in the book. Um, uh, let's see if I can give some quotes. Uh, Got to find it in my book here. Just give me a minute. Well, let me share this comment while you're looking. Uh, with okay. regard to this calendar and the way that it works, you know, again, back there during this time, there was no written down calendar. And they, the Israelites were uh, able to observe how things were unfolding in the heavens. And so, yes. you know, the way that the moon cycles with these seven-day quarterly patterns, in my opinion, there's a reason why the Most High God established the moon with such phase and cycle. And in, again, it aligns to and uh, in helps when you understand the calendar to determine when Sabbath occurs so that just looking up into the heavens, one can then determine uh, the sabbatical cycle and also uh, the occurrence of the Levitical feast days. And so that's yeah. very important uh, because the shepherds, you know, they weren't carrying a pocket calendar around with them to determine when the seven-day continuation of Sabbath was. They were looking at the moon and, uh, and watching the, the phases and the occurrences in the heavens to determine uh, those cycles. Yes, yes. In fact, um, I I did I started studying uh, the Talmud because the Talmud gives an awful lot of information. It's always covered by the corruption that they have learned to follow. But when you get down into the history of the Talmud, which is uh, down at the bottom, after you've gone through the Talmud, there is a part that's called the history. And I found something very interesting. Interesting there, and I thought, oh my goodness, do they even bother wondering what they're what they are saying here? Um, but I'll just read a little bit of it. It says, uh, "We can by no means accuse the reformers in not believing in tradition generally, as we cannot well accuse of that the former Sadducees, e even those reformers who have changed the Sabbath. For even this can be explained in accordance with the general rule of the Talmud." which sanctifies the seventh day, but not the Sabbath itself, which goes against the Ten Commandments right there. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, the Talmud decreed that in case one forgets which day is the Sabbath, he shall count six days and observe the seventh as Sabbath. And I just have to ask the question here. If the Jews could always observe the Sabbath on Saturday, how could they forget which day it was? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, you can't. Right. Sabbath is just, Saturday comes around, comes around. No one has to count. They just look on the calendar. What would Saturday? But here they're saying, if you forget, just start counting six days and add the seventh and use that the Sabbath. And they really didn't have to go very long. All they do is miss that one. And they could keep their, their eyes on the crescent and the crescent once you start really watching the moon change its phases, you can actually start telling approximately about what time of the month it is right. in the in the month, about around the day. So you, you only have one month where you'd be messed up on your Sabbath right. because then when the new moon comes around, you're right back on schedule again. So it's not like a, a constant thing that you forget. It's just that one month that they're saying if you, if you forget to do your counting properly, just get going on it like this. Right. Um, which I thought was a rather interesting thing. Um, there are some other things, uh, like uh, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia has a statement that is so blatant. It says, uh, under their holidays, uh, it says, the new moon is still, and the Sabbath originally was, dependent upon the lunar cycle. Now, this stuff is, is in these books, but people just don't bother going to them because they are told, no, the Sabbath has always been Saturday. And so why even bother researching it? Mm 
Um, but, you know, another one is uh, the Shabbat, which is the weekly Sabbath, originally arose from the lunar cycle. Now, these are in the encyclopedia, the, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia. And they have, and these are under different headings. One I found under holidays, one I found under week, another one I found under new moon. And it says, uh, it says, however, in the diaspora, the new moon came to occupy a secondary position in contrast to a so-called Saturday Sabbath. Now, this is in their encyclopedia. The importance of citing a new moon crescent was confined to the fact that it remained of great value and necessity for the fixing of the festivals. But it, because they went to that Saturday Sabbath, the moon, the moon lost its, its place where it was. Yes, and its connection to the, the feast yes. days. Which, uh, yes. let me read, uh, let me share a passage really quick that confirms like the verses that you are sharing. And I found this in Ezekiel the tragedian it says this month shall be the first month of your year in which I'll lead you to another land which to the Hebrew fathers I did swear and say to all the peoples in this month on full moon's eve the paschal sacrifice to God present and touch the doors with blood which sign the fearsome angel shall pass by and so here it's telling us you know that you know, the Passover is connected to the full moon's eve. Yeah. And so, you yeah. know, I mean, that's undeniable, but please continue. Yeah. Uh, in fact, going on that same thing about the full moon, uh, you can go to the Nicene Fathers. Now, I, you know, a lot of that is, has been corrupted because of Constantine and the church after that starting to become uh, very corrupted with paganism. But back, uh, like in the, two, you know, 200s, uh, there was a one Africanus who wrote the description of what happened during the Passover of the Passion of the Savior. And uh, he said, this darkness, he's talking to a man named Thallus. He says, this darkness, Thallus, in the third book of his history, calls as appears to me without reason an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the 14th day according to the moon. And the passion of our Savior fails on the day before the Passover. But an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun. And it cannot happen at any other time but in the interval between the first day of the new moon and the last day of the old, that is, at their junction. Flagon records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth, manifestly that one of which we speak. But it was a darkness induced by God. Uh -huh. um, so that's he's he's stating it right there that new moon was not the full moon. The full moon was in the middle of the month, and the Methodius Methodius uh -huh. was also he said that too that at the full moon, namely the period and the memorial of the fa of the passion um, there like i said there are quite a few i think i have like when it comes to the sliver being it i think i have like nine different s sources in the back of my uh, just give me the facts please mm -hmm. that that show that um let's see i mean a lot of my um, sources comes from the encyclopedia of Biblica, the Encyclopedia Britannica, Scribner's Dictionary uh, of the Bible. Um, I've got it from Hillel.org, um, um, Rest Days by Hutton Webster. He did a full study. He's got a whole book on all the different um, rest days that are used throughout history in all the different nations um, and all their different peculiarities. And he goes into the Hebrew one. And so I pulled out and looked at those. I practically read the whole book to make sure I had it in the proper context. Mm -hmm. So when people will accuse me of pulling it out of context, uh, you will read Rep Hutton Webster like I did. And you'll see, no, no, he says, it says exactly what he was saying it does. Um, there's, there's an awful lot of uh, Clement, 
um, the, from the Stromoda of Clement. He says in there, the periods of seven days, the moon undergoes its changes. At the end of the first week, she becomes half moon. At the end of the second week, full moon. And at the end of the third week, in her wane, again half moon. And at the end of the fourth week, she disappears. Uh -huh. So there's very, very, very strong information. It's just been hidden for so long. You got to dig. Yes. You got to dig. Yes. And that falls exactly in line with the description uh, given by Enoch. And he also says that the waxing crescent is the beginning of the month and then goes through each day and how it cycles, you know, gaining one seventh a portion of light. Um, so, yes. yeah, exactly in similarity. Yes. Yes. Um, there was an interesting one that I found when I was digging it up, and it was a um, it was a Roman Catholic scholar, an apologist, and he started telling the people that they were all wrong about the Sabbath. And he he said he was on, it was a, a interview that they were giving him, and I got the written interview. And he's saying that our calendar that we follow, follow including Seventh-day Adventists, is not only a calendar that was devised by the Catholic Church, but also it is a calendar that's based upon the solar year, not the lunar year. And the Jewish calendar that was observed in the time of Christ is, follows a lunar calendar, which is several days short of the solar calendar. And he's speaking this, you know, he, they take, in fact, he's... the. Uh, the Catholic Church takes credit for changing. If you read a lot of their stuff, they will say they had the authority to change the Sabbath to Sunday because they were the church. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'm trying to find something else here. Well, while you're looking for that, I want to make another comment here that I was so very grateful to uh, have you send your book to us for publication because, you know, at the time I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I got to write a book on the calendar. Everybody's <laughs> so confused and led astray on it that, you know, and, and then doing the decryption of the, the book of Enoch for Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. There's so much information in those chapters on the courses of the heavenly luminaries, which are calendar related that, you know, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I've got to write another book on the calendar. But finding, you know, having you present your book, I was like, oh, never mind. I don't have to write it. Diane's already done it. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> I'll tell you, the more stuff that's out there that's correct, I think uh, part of the biggest problem that I noticed is that if you do not collect all the information and com and compare it with what the the instructions are in the Bible. You can get things messed up. Right. It is in there, and you if you look at it carefully, you can connect it, and it, it's like a puzzle. The pieces yeah. fit perfectly um, on how to do it. It's in there. It's just um, when you look up information, then you go back and you check it with the instructions in the Bible, and you can see how it fits. Um, another one that, that uh, talks about the phases of the moon, I found in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. This is from 1844 to 1913. It says, there is no direct mention of the phases of the moon in Scripture. A remarkable fact and one that illustrates the foolishness of attempting to prove the ignorance of the sacred writers by the argument from silence, since it is not conceivable that men at any time were ignorant of the fact that the moon changes her apparent shape and size. They so far from the Hebrews being plunged into such a depth of more than savage in ignorance, they base their whole calendar on the actual observation of the first appearance of the young crescent. Um, finding this stuff, it was like finding a treasure each time I found it. It was like, you know, saying, thank you, Father. Because he does reward when we yes. do ask and knock. He he does reward us. And he doesn't want just a feeble little knock, well, I can't find anything. He wants us to keep knocking so that we 
we prove to him we really want to know. Yes, we want to know the truth. It's I'll there. share one and, with you. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, because uh, in similarity, the learning about the calendar uh, and being a person that reads and studies the extra biblical manuscripts, there were numerous, numerous passages from multiple sources which were confirmation uh, to the work that you had laid out in your book. And here's one from the Chronicles of Jeremiah, chapter three. It says, On the first night of the new month, one part is visible. On the second night, a second portion, and so on until the middle of the month when it is full moon. From the middle of the yeah. month outwards, these two clouds turn themselves eastwards, and that part of the moon which appeared first is the first to be covered by the two clouds. On the first night, one part. On the second night, a second part. Until the end of the month when it is entirely covered and devoid of light. And so, yeah, same thing as what you had read mm-hmm. in just different manner, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Hillel, um, on Hillel.org website, they talked about the, the Molad, which is what the Jewish calendar follows now, which is the conjunction, the dark moon. And uh, I'll just read uh, part of that. It says, the calendar is so central to Judaism that it is the first commandment the Jews were ever given as a nation. The lunar month begins at the exact moment when the moon begins its new cycle. At this precise moment, the moon is lined up with the sun and earth in such a way that it is completely invisible. This moment is called the molad, or birth of the new moon. However, the Jewish month was not originally calculated from the molad. Rather, the rabbis point to the verse, this month, which implies that there was something tangible for Moses to see. They teach that the new month begins with the appearance of the new crescent, which is after the Moled. Yes. Uh, so uh, they start out saying the importance of it, and then they put in this for a little bit further down. However, and it's like, um, okay, <laughs> why didn't you just stick with that? But it's mm. what Hillel had done, because right. in the time, time of Hadrian, when they were taken out of Israel, taken out of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they, they, the Jews were forbidden to even be close enough to even see Jerusalem at the time of Hadrian because of the um, of the Bar Kopfa um, re- revolution um, that he forbid the reading of the, the Torah and he told them that they were all to leave Jerusalem. And because that happened, uh, they started getting off not they could not pronounce when the new moon was and so at the time of Hillel which was closer to I believe Constantine he is the one that divulged quote unquote the secret of how how to do the new moon and put it in a calculated state so that everybody would be at the right time and and they did a what they called a calculated moon so that all the nation could be at the same time and that's what put it at the at the molad. It's a fascinating topic, most certainly a, an, an incredible study to do. And um, so even now you find that, you know, most people are hesitant. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask yeah. you this also, Diane, um, because a lot of people, you know, follow just a 364-day solar calendar, and they just set the first day of the year according to the vernal equinox, and then they uh, follow a seven-day, um, every cyclical Sabbath thereafter. Uh, what can you say about that? Because I'm like you. I do absolutely believe that the Israelites, and especially when we go to the Bible, uh, stories like mm-hmm. Jericho and the Exodus, it's clear that um, the Most High gave them a lunar calendar. We'll talk about that as well. But what do you see about the, you know, the some of the people that follow a, just a, a solar calendar, a 364-day solar calendar in, well, in your study? It, yeah, well, it, by doing that, you're ignoring the instructions of God mm. to, uh, to uh, observe a beeb. Now, a beeb means green, which is the barley. Yeah. And uh, Moses himself said to observe 
the first month and to observe Passover uh, and to begin the counting of the the, the seven weeks um, at the bringing of the sickle upon the barley. Yeah. Uh, um, that's that's not the equinox. It isn't it isn't here yet. Right. The barley is not ready yet at the equinox enough to, for them to harvest it. Um, so you you've got to ignore that part where God says specifically when it is, when it's to be, when the first month is, which is, it has to be determined that with the beginning of the first month, that by the time Passover, which is only 14 days, they should be able to harvest, to right. be able to do their first waving of their first Omar um, in the temple on uh, first fruits, which is the 16th. Yes. And then, in, go ahead, Denny. In Psalms 104, 19, it says he made the moon for appointed times. The sun knows it's going down. And, you know, in, in our understanding, he made the sun to keep track of the year. And he made the moon to keep track of the moons. Well, that's, yes. that's where the name yeah. month kem- comes from. Right. And so. Uh, and the weekly know, Sabbath. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. To, to, yeah, to totally ignore one of the things that God put up in the sky is like, uh, okay, so what's it there for? So you're not, not, they're not even bothering to look at the uniqueness of the moon. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've got a chapter that says, uh, you know, gives a whole bunch of things for people to even look at. It's, I, it's called Behold the Moon. And I just ask them questions. Did you know that the moon's illumination changes shape every day? Yes. Every time you look at it in the evening, it's different. It's bigger. It keeps growing. Did you know that the moon's illumination rocks through the year? I don't think people even watch it from month right. to month that it actually rocks. Right. Uh, do you know this rocking tells you when you are approaching the beginning of the appointed first month of Yahweh's calendar? Yes. Did you know that each new moon sliver is a different size? Mm-hmm. Did you know that by seeing that sliver size generally t- tells you if it is to be a 29 or 30 day month? Once you start watching it, you can, I, I pretty much go out there and I can look at it and go, this looks like it's going to be a 29 day month by the size of the month of the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, not good yet. I'm still, uh, you know, back in patent before kindergarten. What is that? Preschool <laughs> in understanding <laughs> that. And then, uh, you know, did you know that the moon rises about 50 minutes later each day? Right. Did you know that the moon follows the sun in its waxing and precedes the sun in its waning? Mm-hmm. Did you know that because the changes of the speed in the moon's course over the face of the earth can vary by 13.4 hours each month, no one really knows the day or the hour of the actual conjunction of the sun and the moon? Right. Uh, and the last one I have is, did you know that the conjunction, dark time, of the moon with the sun, the moon can be hidden in the Middle East, Israel, from 1.5 days to almost 3.5 days. So God has, the moon has such a course that for us to ignore it, we ignore a very intricate part of his timepiece. That he's absolutely. got up there. Absolutely, I uh, absolutely agree. And you know, this year is a perfect example of the importance with regard to, you know, the alignment of the lunar phases according to, uh, with also with unleavened bread, uh, because unleavened bread yep. is always the fifteenth, and that is always a full moon. And because yes. this year. Um, we have the full moon occurring right now in connection with the vernal equinox or near it that, you know, you can't have because it would be the next day. It would be tomorrow that the barley would have to be uh, ripe and ready for the waving uh, of the sheaf as far as the day of first fruits. And so that's why we have a 13th month this year because the barley is not ripe and it's not ready. So we have Adar 2, which, again, for those that don't understand, Enoch describes literally 
the cycles of a 364-day solar year as well as a 354-day lunar year and how you can put these two together. It's just usually around every third year or so, according to the metatonic cycle, you just add a 13th month, a DAR2, and then it realigns uh, the calendar, the two calendar systems back together. And I mean, it's a beautifully simplistic. And according to the way that all the luminaries are moving, it's really an easy calendar to follow once you understand the intricate workings yes. of it. And it's one that you can follow along with in the skies, in the heavens daily, you know. And so, yeah, I agree with you. I, I love the way that the Most High set it up. And the fact that the lunar phases are perfectly aligned to Sabbath is, in my opinion, undeniable that there's a link between the quarterly phases and that of each of the seven-day Sabbaths, the four Sabbaths of each lunar month, which um, I want to go to the story of Jericho because, you know, so mm -hmm. many people say, oh, there's no lunar calendar in the Bible, but yet there are numerous stories which actually confirm uh, that it is only by following a lunar calendar that the things that are revealed in Scripture could actually be true. And so let's talk about how Joshua and the Israelites were commanded to march around Jericho for seven days. And if, yes. if you know, Sabbath is one in every seven days, that would not be possible and God would be breaking his commandment uh, to have a Sabbath day of rest. And so if you would, can you explain this occurrence and how it can be explained according to the sure. lunar model? Sure. Uh, the one you're, the, what you're talking about is the, to Joshua is Joshua 6, 3. Uh, it says, And ye shall compass the city, all the men of war, going about the city once. So they are to be dressed in, in war apparel. Now, to understand what's going on here, you go to the Mishnah and read their instructions about Shabbat. It says, A man should not go out with a sword, bow, shield, club, or spear. And if he went out, he is liable to a sin offering. So that's right there. God is telling them that they are to be men of war to go out and compass the city. So, um, and it says that you shall do six days and seven priests shall bear seven ram's horns before the ark. And the seventh day, you shall compass the city seven times. And, uh, and the people shall go up every man straight before him on that day. Well, if you look at it like, okay, there you got your six days and the seventh right there, they are uh, going right against what God, what is supposed to be set up. But there is another incident in Jasher about this Joshua um, march. And Jasher uh, chapter 88, 14, it starts out with, and it was in the second month, on the first day of the month, that the Lord said to Joshua, Rise up, behold, I have given Jericho into thy hand with all, all thy people thereof, and all your fighting men shall go round the city. Every man, you know, so right there, Jasher is saying when it started. It started on New Moon Day. So if it started on New Moon Day, and you count that day one, it is not a Sabbath. It is a day of of worship, but it is not a Sabbath because God would not have them do any marching on the Sabbath. So you've got that as day one and you count seven. Well, that's the seventh day. And the eighth day would, would be the seventh day of the, of the week because the week starts the day after the new moon day. The first working day would be started counting the day after new moon day because new moon day is not a work day nor a Sabbath. So you would say new moon day is day one, and then day one of the work day is the very next day. So it's really one, one uh, when you're counting it. And you've got your six days right there, which would be this. I know it sounds confusing um, how to even explain this. If you had a calendar in front of you, I could explain it more. Where you take new moon day, and then the first day after new moon day is the first work 
working day. And they're only marching around that Jericho the six working days. Right. Okay. Exactly. Because, yeah, because it's the last sixth working day that they actually attack Jericho, which would exactly. be the seventh day if you add right. the new moon day. Right. And then the eighth day is the Sabbath, and they aren't attacking anymore. They're done. They're right. done. Exactly. So they're not. They're not violating the Sabbath at all by marching around because they started on New Moon Day. Right. And it's only, again, it is only by understanding the way that the Most High established and gave back to Israelite, the Israelites the calendar during the Exodus, even with the mm -hmm. way that uh, Passover you know, occurs on the day before the full moon, and that uh, the Exodus occurred um, after Sabbath was celebrated from dawn to dusk, and then that night they went out on the full moon and began yes. their Exodus march. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At the time of the full moon, there is right. another incident in the Bible that taught that shows that very same thing. Like in Joshua, uh, it was a battle that took seven days. Okay, that they they engaged the battle on the seventh day. And it's in 1 Kings 20, starting in verse 26. And it came to pass at the beginning of the year that Barhadad gave orders to the Amore Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. Now, at the beginning of the year was Abib. And when it's at the beginning of the year, then what they're saying is it was the first, it was the first month of the year, which would have been new moon mm -hmm. and they encamped one over against the other seven days and so it was that in the seventh day of the battle was joined and the children of israel slew the armenians a hundred thousand footmen in one day yes so yes. that shows right there that that it happened again so there are two incidences in the bible that show the seven day right and then uh, to show how new moon is separate from the Sabbath, you read in Exodus the instructions of Yahweh that he gave to Moses on setting up the tabernacle that they worked on in the, in the uh, wilderness. He said, uh, on the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And it came to pass on the first day month in the second year on the first day of the month that the tabernacle was reared up now that may not seem like a big thing but if you start reading what it took what all you know the what right. they made for the tabernacle and that it wasn't just the tabernacle but, but they also started um they sanctified the high priest and the priests on that very same day so it was a whole day affair that yeah. they did this and then the priests were to sit in the front of the of the tabernacle for seven days, <laughs> right. and they Hold were saying, we're, "We're at break. Uh, we'll be right okay. back, everybody, and then we'll cover it up. We'll uh, cover a lot more in the second hour. Get you a drink of water or something. We'll be right back, everyone. Okay." Welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. I am your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And I have a special guest with me, both Denny and Diane Culver. And Diane is the author of Yahweh's Timepiece, uh, Unique Timepiece Explained. And this particular uh, part, I would like to start. Well, actually, Diane, let me let you finish what you were talking about before we went to break. And then um, I'd like to go into Exodus a little bit to talk about how it is that 
only again according to the lunar calendar because we see that Sabbath according to the lunar calendar occurs every 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. Uh, but if you would, I want to give you a chance to finish up your thought. Uh, it was really pretty much finished. I okay. didn't have too much more to say, so... <clears throat> Okay, great. All right, well then let's uh, start with this. In Exodus 16, it says in the first verse, Then they took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And so you see that and when you understand that every 15th is a full moon Sabbath, according to the lunar calendar, that this is on a full moon Sabbath that they reach this particular area and then they have um, rest. And then God comes to Moses, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And so God tells them, you know, he's going to send them, well, the quails in evening, and then on the very next morning of the, what would be the first day of the the new week, he sends them the six days of manna. And then you have what would be on the 22nd, which is Sabbath, they did not receive manna. And so, again, this particular story, the story of the manna, and when you study very closely the story even of Exodus, of how the Passover occurs um, that night uh, at midnight, the, the angel, the Lord, the angel of death goes and strikes down all the firstborn. And then in some stories, it says that Pharaoh calls uh, Moses and Aaron to, you know, to come to him, and then he gives them permission to leave. But in other stories, it says that he went to them because they were, you know, they were um, uh, in the protection of their home and uh, told them then that they could leave. And so they celebrate um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread from sunrise to, uh, I mean, from sunrise from dawn to dusk. And then at night, it tells you that that's when they leave. They begin the exodus on that full moon night. And so the very following month on the 15th, you have where the Most High tells them he's going to begin the whole giving them six days of manna. And it also aligns with the 15th being the full moon and the Sabbath. And so can you comment on that as well? Um, yeah, that's, it does say that. Uh, I'm trying to find it here. Um I'm, you know, I've been agreeing with everything you said, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to elaborate, because uh, that's exactly what's going what it on. Says. It yeah. says what it's, it says. Yeah, if if right, you read exactly. it carefully, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of times mm -hmm. people just read it as a story, and they don't understand the instructions and what is actually being said there, because it is setting down a pattern. And right. Moses told the people on the night of Passover, do not leave your homes till morning. Yes. So right. we know that they didn't leave on the night of Passover. They right. were they were liberated because Pharaoh had sent a message to Moses saying, uh, you know, you guys can leave, take everything. But they were all instructed not to leave their homes yes. until morning. And so it wasn't until the 15th. So if they didn't get that message till then, they really couldn't start packing up until the 15th. So they really didn't pull out until the Sabbath day was ended with all of their stuff and they left, mm -hmm. left in the evening mm -hmm. look at it i mean when you sit and read it carefully that's the one thing we read scriptures so much uh, people say oh i know that story well you know the story but do you know the details right. and it's same with with the uh, manna that the details are there it's very poignant what he says it's very plain what God says, that the manna will not start until the morning, right. that he will give them quail in the evening, which is at the end of the Sabbath yes, exactly. day, and in the morning is when they will start their work. And I right. have a feeling, if you think about how small 
how small that stuff was, like coriander seed, that was work. Mm-hmm. That was work. And they, they, you know, for them to, to gather that. And so God says, make sure you gather enough on the mm-hmm. sixth day because I don't want you out there doing that. Right, double portion. Yes, and so, you know, yeah. again, that's another one of the stories that is confirming witness. But um, yes. in your research, Diane, can you talk about others and just other things that you uh, learned and, um, you know, other confirming witnesses from your book as to this particular model for observing the calendar? Oh, well, I mean... The one, the one thing I'd like to bring up which in 2012, I'm a systems analyst by trade, and I started really digging into this in 2012. And uh, in fact, I dialogued with the Hebraic Roots leader for a whole year on this issue and trying to show him that if you're keeping a Sabbath according to Saturday, when Leviticus 23 says uh, on the morrow after the Sabbath, and it's talking about Resurrection Day on the 16th, uh, it's like when they're setting their Sabbath to Saturday, uh, you, you sometimes have to wait five or six days before you celebrate the resurrection. Uh-huh. And I kept going through this and saying, uh, you know, he, you're putting him in the grave for six days. He said, well, he's not in the grave anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like, and, you know, it just it doesn't fit Leviticus at all to use two calendars. And right. you you got right. to you got to stick to uh, the fourteenth is Passover, um, the fifteenth is Sabbath. He was in the grave, and the sixteenth he was rose again. And the only way that that whole uh, Passover week works, it, it bookends the uh, whole um, the whole week with Sabbaths. And if you otherwise, you got to sign high Sabbaths and all these right, crazy right. things that people do to make yes. it work. But right. it's it's interesting. Uh, while while I'm on this, uh, in 2012, I started researching using Stellarium. Uh, can you can you read uh, Revelation 12:1? Okay. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now what I found was that uh, that scripture is fulfilled every year uh, with Virgo, okay? The the woman is Virgo in in the heavens, and when the sun is at her side and the moon is beneath her feet, it happens one day a year, and that's right on Feast of Trumpets. Right. Okay. Right. And and I did like 50 years trying to figure out when do you add the new month? Uh, is there a pattern to it? Uh, it's difficult to find a pattern. I, th- I think I finally caved in uh, because we were doing the new month when nobody else was. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's interesting. We we lose about 11 degrees on the on the solar calendar every year the sun falls a little bit behind and then and then they, that's why they have to add the extra month but it's fascinating to me that um, people even messianics that study and and even watch the moon watch it in Israel have no clue or they won't accept the fact that the Sabbath is tied to the moon and so yeah. they say blow the shofar and all that but but it's not important to them because it does not set their Sabbaths and so, so we find ourselves all alone sometimes. <laughs> right. I understand. Uh, Diane, I wanted to also ask you about, and if you would, can you talk about uh, Pentecost, uh, Shavuot, and how that is established, these seven perfect weeks, which, you know, according to this calendar, you exclude uh, the Kadesh and translation days, and it gives you... Um, it, well, I'll let you explain it. And then after that, if you would, I'd like to go into the resurrection and how it was that uh, you were able to determine that Sabbath is only celebrated from a dawn to dusk. Okay. Um, I To start out with, um, I did, I questioned 
question. I thought, okay, Father, why do you keep saying six days labor? Uh, you do your work and the seventh day is the Sabbath. And he says this seven times. This, this commandment is given in the books of Moses, in the first five books. Well, that's his number, seven. And the thing is, I really felt I, what he showed me was he was reiterating his very first feast that was more numerous in, in the month than any others. And that's why in Leviticus, it starts out with that, the, se- the six days work and seventh, when he says, these are my feasts. Uh, in Leviticus 23, he starts out with the Sabbath, and he talks about six days you shall work in the seventh. And I thought, okay, so why are you starting that out? What does that mean? And I started realizing that that's a, that he's constantly saying this is a special thing you're supposed to look for: six consecutive days of work and the seventh for rest, because you can't follow Shavuot. You can't find Shavuot without that perfect Sabbath week. Right. That is a, a perfect Sabbath week. And that that's in one of my chapters, I talk about what does he mean by six days works and the seventh rest. I go into the seventh perfect. Uh, Shavuot, first you have to understand uh, what the, the main, you know, the name of it, Shavuot uh, or Pentecost. You have to understand what the title means. Shavuot means feast of weeks. Shavuot means weeks. And, but Pentecost means 50th. So you've got two different things here and people say, well, it's Pentecost. Well, what do you mean by Pentecost? You have to understand Shavuot if you want to understand what Pentecost means. And, um, I mean, God called it Shavuot for a reason. He is, he didn't say, uh, the feast of counting 50 days. He said Shavuot, the feast of weeks. So he was expecting a certain counting to be done. And it wasn't 50 days. It was seven perfect Sabbath weeks, yeah. seven perfect Sabbaths. He says, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days. In other words, you count those seven, well, that's 49 days if you count the seven weeks, perfect weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And the word complete there in in the Hebrew language is tamim. And that means undefiled, perfect, without blemish, entire. And that's a word that was used when they were to bring the sacrifice. It was to be tamim. It was to be perfect without blemish. So why would he call Sabbaths? How, you know, how do you defile a Sabbath? There's got to be something there that he's saying, you better make sure you're following my perfect Sabbath week to get the proper counting. Yes. And, you know, so, and it's it's repeated again in Deuteronomy. And uh, Moses just says, seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou begin to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto Yahweh. Okay, so he's saying, first count the seven weeks, and then keep the feast of weeks, which is after it, which is your 50th day. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times you don't read both of them. If you don't read everything where all the instructions are, you won't get the full picture of how it fits. Right. As Moses says, seven weeks in Deuteronomy, he had to understand the concept of a perfect Sabbath week to associate his instructions with the instructions of Yahweh in Leviticus 23 and Numbers 28. Yes. And, you know, each one of those seven weeks was the celebration, the offering up of a different crop each week, the seven predominant crops that are grown in Israel. And so, you know, you have to have, again, that perfect full week to celebrate the offering up that particular crop and and then it also falls in similarity in the way that jubilees you know with the the 49 days and then the 50th day um but again the yeah. seven perfect weeks if you don't understand that kadesh and translation days are excluded from that well then it it doesn't make sense but when you understand that it is seven perfect weeks then you know that 
the seventh week is always the eighth. That Sabbath is always the eighth of Sivan because you have Sabbath celebrated in, according to the mm -hmm. lunar calendar, the eighth, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. And so that 50th day would always be the ninth of Sivan. So Pentecost, uh, Shavuot is always celebrated on the ninth of Sivan. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Uh, when I was first looking into this, uh, there was one guy that had a, a site on the internet that was uh, just poo pooing the whole thing about saying, you can't, how can they say it's by the lunar when they say that it's always the ninth of Sivan? It can't be that way. <laughs> and I, I sat there and I thought, I thought, well, wait a minute now. Um, you are claiming that the sixth of Sivan is always Pentecost. According to the Jewish calendar, that is what is in the, the, the Talmud. The sixth of Savan has been set as as uh, Pentecost. Um, so why couldn't you say that there is a specific day that comes up, and it always will be the ninth, because that's the day after the first Sabbath of the final week right. of counting. So it's always going to have that number of the month. So there's no big mystery or thing like, oh, that's ridiculous. It can't, you know, the month is always numbered out, 1 yeah. through 29 or 1 through 30. Right. And each day has its number. And the week is going to be in there, always in that fixed time after the new moon. It's always going to start with that count. And it's always going to be the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th of each month. Right. And you know, so it's... It, it's uh, it's not a big mystery. It's just a matter of learn it, just practice it, and find out. It's, it's really not that difficult. It sounds at first it's kind of like anything. Uh, you fish a certain way off a certain side of a boat, and someone comes and tells you, you know, it fishes better off this side, and you go, oh, I don't know if I can change. <laughs> and that's really what the calendar has done to us. You know, yeah, you can. Yeah, maybe a little rough at time for a while, but pretty soon you'll say, "Hey, this isn't so bad." In fact, it's better fishing off this side. Yeah. Um, I have in my book. I have um, calendar in there for both the seventh month to show how to count uh, tabernacles, and then I do have the counting of the uh, seven Sabbaths uh, in there too. That takes you to Pentecost and shows you how it is actually laid out now i lay it out on the calendar that is familiar but the it's only laid out in the squares it's not to kind of give you an idea of how it lays out uh, but then there you know each week is a different shaded tone so that you can see it and it shows you that the moon is sighted and then new moon um, several of the months had a 30th day that are in my book it's in i use the months of a uh, in 2014 and happened to be that that, that year a beeb had 30 days the moon was not sighted on the 29th so you add another day and that makes you know that makes new moon on on the you know the next day and the ir which is the second lunar month that all also had a 30th day the moon was not seen on the 29th or the last sabbath uh so it had it on there too and sometimes you don't get that it'll be seen depending on the year how god has it so you don't know the proper counting unless you do the seven perfect sabbath weeks because you've got those days that aren't in the perfect sabbath week those added days where the moon is incited and the new moon day, you have to you, you have to have those that are on the calendar, but you skip those. You don't count those until the very first day again of the first perfect Sabbath week, which is six days work, and then the seventh day of Sabbath. And like I said, it sounds confusing. People are going, What the heck is she saying? But if you get my book and look at it and read it and look at the calendar, you'll start to understand it. If you read really want to know it you just start doing it you just start doing it i would take my calendar and start actually writing in big numbers day one day two to get it in my head what was going on with god's calendar according to what i had to follow with the gregorian calendar or our modern day calendar it's 
Pope Gregory is the one that set it up in the you know 16th century in the 1500s. Um, so it, I just call it the Gregorian calendar, but it's it's our modern day calendar. And once you do that, pretty soon you can just you find yourself what day is it on the Gregorian? You start getting that messed up because you're following the lunar more with what is correctly done. Um, I have to actually go and look at the calendar because it is isn't a, a automatic thing with me anymore with the uh, modern day calendar because I keep track of the Sabbaths and God's feast days according to his calendar and I watch that more closely. And for those that um, are may be unfamiliar and you want a visual representation of what we're talking about, uh, we do provide a calendar through Sacred Word Publishing uh, called the the ancient Enochian lunar solar calendar. And we have converted the Gregorian into all the um, the Hebrew months and days and the years and have all the Levitical feast days and Passover and all of that written on and part of this particular calendar. And um, in fact, we have for today, Purim, the vernal equinox, the 14th of Adar, uh, second month, uh, 14th of Dar 2 and the 13th month of 6001 is what I determined the year to be. I know there's some discrepancy on all of that, but the 21st tomorrow would be the 15th of Adar 2, the 13th month, 6001, Shushan Purim, the full moon Sabbath. And so, you know, we have each of these days. Um, uh, determined for you to make it easier to follow along and also to learn the Hebrew months. And also we have the names of what each of those months mean on the, the calendar as well. And so I'll post that link into the chat room and also provide it in the show description. And so these two things together, Diane's book and this calendar, it will help you to better understand all of the things that we're talking about this evening, but uh, if you would, Diane, can you, because I know we're going to quickly run out of time, but I want to give you a chance to um, confirm why it is that Sabbath should be celebrated from dawn to dusk. Um, okay, well, again, I, I started researching it and looking for uh, different, you know, encyclopedias or anything like that that would talk about it and again you a lot of the jewish uh things that i found um they had it in there there i have i think like eight different sources i'm sure if i were to continue digging i, I just finally thought okay, okay that's enough that's more than the three witnesses that's necessary to prove a right. point <laughs> and i just you know it's like okay eight is good that's a good number to show them it's out there it's there um like the encyclopedia biblica um, they say from dawn to dark was the ancient and ordinary meaning of a day, Yom, among the Israelites. Okay, uh, night as being the time when no man can work, John 9, 4. Okay, uh, and it wasn't uh, in, in the, that same place. It says not till post-exalic times. Do we find traces of a new mode of reckoning which makes day begin at sunset? There is another writing I found. It was called The Jewish Festivals, History and Observance. And it says this is, it says, this is the most blatant one that I hit it and went, oh my gosh, there it is. There's the fence that they set up. In order to assure against profanation, profaning of the Sabbath, the Jews added, now this is an earlier thing, so they're, they're talking Friday, Saturday, and stuff like that, okay? The Jews added the late Friday afternoon hours to the Sabbath. So they put it as a fence so that people, the people would not profane the Sabbath. In other words, look, get ready for Sabbath the night before. So then you, when you wake up, you won't be doing anything to profane the Sabbath. That's what it, it was considered, you know, at the time, this is a good fence this is a good fence it's going to protect people from doing things sabbath morning when they shouldn't be um another one judaism between yesterday and tomorrow 
Uh, this was done by Kung. He was a Jew. Um, he said, if we look at the essentials of a day of rest and reflection, which has a religious orientation, it is possible to ju justify the shifting of the Sabbath worships, worship to Friday evening, the celebration of which was moved back to the eve of the feast as early as the Middle Ages. Uh, so those are the two that I found like, okay, these are talking about it being a fence that happened. Then the Jewish Encyclopedia, uh, it talks, when it talks about a day, it says, in order to fix the beginning and ending of the Sabbath day and festivals and to determine the precise hour for certain religious observances, it becomes necessary to know the exact times of the rising and setting of the sun. According to the strict interpretation of the Mosaic law, every day begins with sunrise and ends with sunset. Now that's the Jewish encyclopedia. Under day, it says Hebrew Yom in the Bible, the season of light, Genesis 1-5, lasting from dawn, literally the rising of the morning to the coming forth of the stars. Um, so, you know, there's the, I just kept finding things like this. Um, Jacob Lauterbach, he was uh, in the Hebrew in the Hebrew Union College Press, he wrote this in Rabbinic Essays. When does the Sabbath begin? There can be no doubt that in pre-exilic, exilic, I can't get that word out, times, the Israelites reckoned the day from morning to morning. The day began with the dawn and closed with the end of the night following it i.e. the last moment before the dawn of the next morning, and it was evening and it was morning one day. This passage was misunderstood by the Talmud, but it was correctly interpreted by Samuel B. Meyer. Now, Samuel B. Meyer was the grandson of Rashi, and I'm sure a lot of people don't know who Rashi was, but he was one of the predominant commentaries that uh, did their, the commentaries in, the, in their Tanakh, in their Bible, in the commentary section of their, their books, Rashi was, they always had like three or four, but Rashi was the predominant one that they always looked at. So this was Rashi's grandson that made this remark. He said, it does not say that it was nighttime and that it was daytime, which made one day, but it says it was evening, which means that the period of the daytime came to an end and the light disappeared. And when it says it was morning, it means that the period of the nighttime came to an end and the morning dawn. Then one whole day was completed. And that is, if you really sit and look at it and read it, um, when you look at the day, the very first day that was created, it, it says right there, okay, if we look at it, that Yeshua is the word. All right? And so not everything that was brought into creation was by him which was by this, him being spoken the word being spoken is what started creation what were the first words spoken light be okay so if those were the first words spoken that was before it said evening and morning so you've got the beginning of the first creation day at the spoken words light be so that's being done during the first day, and then it was evening, and then it was morning, and that concluded the first day. Because then the very next thing says, and God said, well, that's the beginning of the next day when he begins his creation again. Mm -hmm. yep, just one little aside. Go ahead, Danny. One little aside. Uh, Yeshua said, are there not 12 hours in a day? Exactly, yes, that's right. Right. And there are other verses also that I've come across that give confirming witness to this. Um, uh, but I'm not going to share that because I, I want to give you time to bring out, you know, anything else that you'd like to cover with regard to your book. Um, also, Diane, why don't you read just the titles of the chapters? so that people can get an idea for the content. All right, let me get to the front of the book. Um, Tell them about what each one is. Okay, um, it starts out with your for my forward introduction. I've got one that I just uh, put in with this last uh, 
edition of the book. It's called Jewish Nope Hebrew because I, I had some people saying, well, I, I, you know, you've got a lot of Jewish words in there, so I had to skip over theirs. So I start, I have that in there to explain what the words are, why I use them, and why, you know, for clarification throughout the book, because the, the Hebrew words, they clarify certain things that English words don't give you. Right. Um, and then I go, uh, yeah, you want answers? I go into the different, I read that at the beginning. When is Yahweh Sabbath? A calendar by any other name. What does Yahweh mean by six days work, the seventh rest, Shavuot or Pentecost? Can you please expand Explain how Yahweh's calendar works. Behold the moon. New moon day, concealed, full, or crescent. Why sight the moon from Israel? When does a day begin? What do we do about day of atonement? Okay, so here are my questions. Then I end it with, just give me the facts, please. Then I have Appendix A, which is Matthew 1240 under the microscope. And Appendix B, but Dio Cassius said, and then my conclusion. I'd like to talk a little bit about the one Appendix B, but Dio Cassius said, why I even put that in the book. Um, <clears throat> there was one argument that kept coming up in different groups that they would say, well, look, there's Roman historians that show that the Sabbath was always on Saturday. So, you know, how can you refute that? So I thought, okay, it's time for me to go study this Roman. One of them was Dio Cassius. That's usually the one that they would use because he kept talking about the, the Israelites being um, taken on their sacred, the day that they called sacred, which was Saturday. Okay. Uh, the problem with that is when Dio Cassius was, okay, he... Uh, he was born in 155 CE, and he died in 235 CE, okay? And his writing took place around 220 CE, okay? So he wasn't even born at the time of Hadrian's expelling of the Jews from Jerusalem, forbidding the reading of the Torah and stopping their calendar. Dio never knew the Jews as a nation, because at that time, they were scattered. They were not even looked at as a nation. They were just a people, a religious people, religious group. Uh, nor was he aware of their ways according to their holy days, because it was way beyond the time that they were expelled by Hadrian. Okay, so, and he also has his things. I mean, the Julian calendar was the main Roman calendar at the time of Cassius, and the one that he followed. The old lunar Roman calendar with its calends, ides, and knowns reckoning was also still in use at that time. There were a few other calendars in, in his territory being used too, like the Macedonian, Egyptian, and Jewish as beginning to fold into the Roman calendar because they were their calendar had to be abandoned in 135 CE with Hadrian forbidding it. Okay, and the Julian calendar was side by side with the old lunar nundunial figuring, which was used, uh, which used the titles of the calends, which was the beginning of the month, knowns, which meant at the end of the month, and eyes, which dealt with the middle of the month. And there were still eight days, you know, a week. And they were letters right. for the seven days. They, they didn't start the uh, um, putting the days until after. Um, oh, I think it was a, it was started around the second century that they started putting the actual days um, using the, the pagan names. Okay. And on top of that, uh, Julius Caesar, he, um, the, the Nundulial cycle was eventually replaced by the seven day week, which began with the day of Saturn. So Saturn or Saturday was the first day of the week. Well, the Jews didn't use the first day. They, they used the seventh. So oh, that didn't even fit. And that was during the time of Dio Cassius. In fact, in his writings, he talks about that, about, the, about Saturn being the first day of the week. So you have to understand when he's talking, what he's talking about. He's talking about at, at that time, 
uh, the Jews, they still, you read it in the scriptures, that they followed, they carried their star of their God with them, Remphan. Uh-huh. Well, that was sad. And because they were not following God in a lot of ways, they were, you know, they were not doing what they were supposed to do. And, and God was uh, upset with them that they were carrying their gods with them, Remphan, which was the, the, the star of their gods. And so the Romans knew what that was, what the because the Jews used that star in their symbols and stuff like that. And so Dio just put that as, well, that was the day sacred to them. Saturn was saved. Well, it wasn't, but Dio put that with them because they used that as the, you know, as their symbol. And the Romans knew what that symbol was. They knew the symbol of all those gods. They knew Kronos. Kronos was Remphan. That was the, the star of Saturn or Saturday. And so it, you know, you had to go back into my appendix and I've got several different writings where it talks about that and shows when Saturday was the first day of the week and that was during that time. It was way back in BC that Saturn, you know, was it, it was the first day of the week. All right. Zed, did you want Diane to expound on the resurrection? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Oh. That would be great. Oh, that's that's a little bit more involved um, <laughs> because that's everybody you know well, we goes on that, 15, that one. We've got fifteen. Uh, excuse me, fifteen <laughs> minutes. So, uh, whatever you feel like you would like to cover, um, but definitely, people get Diane's book, read it for yourself. It's a treasure trove of incredible information with regard to this topic. Like I said, I was glad that I didn't have to write one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, another one that people keep bringing up, and they just, you know, they say, "Well, I, I can't, I can't give that up." It's, you know, they, they can't seem to understand that when God sets patterns, He sets them for a purpose. Therefore, signs for us. Even uh, Jesus Himself said, "Look, you can read the sign of the skies, but you can't even read the seasons you're in." And God set him up. He set up Passover. He set up unleavened bread. And he set up uh, first fruits right in order to fit with the resurrection so that his people would see that sign when Yeshua did it. When he died, he died on Passover. You know, you know, that whole sign there, it was there. It was there. The Passover he had with his disciples was the night of the 13th because he wanted to be able to celebrate it with him because he knew he was going to be the sacrificial Passover lamb right on Passover because he was the true sign and it had to follow exactly. I mean, if people, a lot of people say, well, that it happened just that way, just, just because he was there. And I, I think, okay, so what you're telling me is that God is going to cause all of his people to be in confusion and let the Passover lamb whenever, but then when he comes, it's going to be right exactly at the right time where the Sabbath is going to be right after Passover. Uh, that's confusion. That, that God wants his people to know. He set those up so that we would know his times. We right. can't know his times if he's going to confuse them on us. You know, then he can't chide us and say, you can't even read the signs. Well, he wouldn't chide the people if he didn't expect it to be following exactly to what was set up at the very beginning. And his Passover was set up that way. And Matthew 12, 40 is the one that people always go to and say, look, uh, you've got the three days and three nights thing here. Well, that puts that that puts uh, the day that Christ rose on the fourth day, not the third day, if you follow that. If you look at the night he was crucified, which was the 14th, the, the day that he would raise them would be on the 17th, and you can't do that. That doesn't follow. That's not, that's not correct. Um, in my book, I go through that whole thing. In the on Appendix A, I go through Matthew and walk through and show you everything, the scriptures that are used and how they saw what, what Jesus was saying, that everybody understood that he rose on the third day, not after the third day. Um, it's it's a very you know extensive thing for me to really get into too much detail. 
Um, but there are writings, um, quotes from different writings that uh, bring in that where they understand perfectly when the, the whole thing that he died on the 14th and he rose on the 16th, the day right. after the Sabbath. Um, and there's all kind, you know, it's from the fragments of Clemens of Alexandria, uh, the uh, Constitutions of the Holy Apostles talk about it, Ignatius talks about it, um, they go through it, and they they see, abs- they talk about it as if there is no problem at all. The problem is with us understanding what three days and three nights means. Mm-hmm. First of all, uh, you have to understand, with the Bible, there's always the rule of first mention. Uh, when a subject is being talked about, you have to go back to the rule of first mention to be able to make any sense of it. And then you have to have at least two witnesses mentioning that going back to that first mention. You don't put that first mention in as one of the witnesses. You use two witnesses to point to that first mention. So when you look at the mention of Jonas and the three days and three nights, it's only mentioned once. It only refers to Jonas once going back to the three days and three nights. But there is in two um, two books, which is, let me see which one. I got to find the Jonah thing in my book to, um, to make sense of it. Oh, I got... Go well, this. Let me just add while you're doing that that um, okay. Yeshua was the Passover lamb without spot or blemish. The you know that yep. was sacrificed, and then he was entombed and his body lay for the unleavened bread, and he was resurrected as the high priest because during mm-hmm. that time that he was away from his body, he went down and resurrected Adam and all of his righteous seed took them up into yes. paradise. They were the resurrected first fruits. He offered them to his father as the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And so he that was the wave offering. They were the barley um, that, you know, the, the, that was waved for the sin of Israel. And so he fulfilled exactly those particular festivals. And then you know, 40 days after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles and he fulfills Shavuot as well. And so we know that he will return on the Feast of Trumpets because we have those fall feasts remaining and that he will fulfill them in similar manner as he fulfilled the spring and summer feasts. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And he had to rise on first fruits. Be- I mean, The disciples knew it. It says now, but now is the Messiah risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Yes. So, you know, they they saw him as the first fruits. And if you read the scriptures where it talks about the women seeing where he was laid and it it talks about the preparation day. Well, the preparation day, uh, which was Passover, happened to be the last day of the week, the work week. And so there was also called the preparation day for the Sabbath the next day. That was that was just a common term that they called, called it there. And if the preparation day is, uh, you know, that day, that makes the Sabbath the seventh day of the week, which is the last day of the week, that makes the first day of the week when they went back to the tomb, uh, the first day of the week. That makes right. it the 16th First day of the week. I mean, yeah. it's right there. It says, if, if Sabbath is the last day, and it says on the first day they go to the tomb and he's gone, well, that's the first day of the new week that right. he arose. It wasn't several days later. It was yeah. right after the Sabbath. And even, you know, you, you read the scriptures and you look at when he died and when he arose, according to scripture, you can't even get a full almost a full two days and two nights in there. Uh-huh. So you have to understand the Hebrew meanings of what is being spoken and how they looked at a day. You know, any portion of the day was a day. Uh-huh. Okay? And so, you know, and with Jonah, it was only mentioned once. And the, the two things, though, is in Matthew is one of the books, and Luke 
is the other that talks about Jonah. The one talks about three days and three nights as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. But the other one doesn't say that. Matthew says Jonah was in three days and three nights. Luke doesn't. Luke just says Jonah, talks about Jonah, the sign of Jonah. Well, what was then the sign of Jonah? If he mentions it in one and not in the other, what is it? Well, there is one thing that is mentioned in both books. It says, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is he. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with his generation and with this generation and she can condemn it. For she came from uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And this is also spoken in Luke. So you have two, um, two uh, gospels that witness and go back to Jonah. But what they're talking talking about is the preaching of Jonah not the belly of the whale because if you even look at the um, where Jonah was spit up out of the whale by the time he reached Nineveh he looked normal again and no one knew he was in the belly of the whale in Nineveh all they heard was his preaching and they repented and Jesus is bringing up here <laughs> you know they're going to rise up and condemn you because one greater than Jonah, one greater than Solomon is here, and you won't even listen to me saying, uh -huh. repent. And so to me, I look at that like, these are really the two witnesses. But it's hard to get past that. If people don't really study it and realize they can't use Jonah as one of the witnesses because right. they are supposed to be pointing back to that. And you should have at least two witnesses. According to scripture, you need... Two witnesses to establish a matter, yes. at least two. I agree, and that that was the one thing for my son. It was difficult for him to understand the the concept as far as the either the resurrection and Christ being the uh, the high priest for the day of first fruits and the wave offering and all of that. And so, um, yeah. But yes, I agree. You have to have uh, multiple witnesses. Uh, well, we've got like four yeah. minutes remaining, Diane, and so I want to give you a chance to uh, give out your website, your contact information, um, all of that, anything that you'd like to share with the listening audience. Certainly we'll do a follow-up again at some point because, uh, yeah, I just really thoroughly enjoyed doing the show with you and Danny, and I definitely want to give you a chance to bring out more of your research and the work that you've done. Uh, but if you would also make mention of the new book that you're working on as well. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Our website is the repairer of the breach.org. Our email is isa5812 at wildblue.net. And uh, people have already, when they have bought the book, they have already contacted and, and talked to me a little bit and asked me questions. And I am willing uh, to do research. And if I, you know, if it's a question that I haven't really researched, I will research it and have the discussion with, with people. And it's been really uh, kind of fun uh, with the last couple people. They've been very, very excited. They bought the book and contacted me and they're just new at it. And they say, I don't understand this. And I'll say, well, you got to read, keep reading the book. It's on page thus and such. And if you still don't understand it, I will explain it further and I will walk through them with it. And it's been kind of, you know, they've really enjoyed it. And so have I, uh, oh. my new book is, uh, called, and he shall crush thy head, um, exposing subtle deceptions of the enemy. And I go, um, into trying to help the church, those who are seeking in the church are the ones who are really going to be looking at it. I mean, if they're stuck in their mode and saying, no, 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 this, no, this is the correct thing, what I have, you know, just like anything, they probably aren't going to be wanting to read it. But if they are curious and really want to understand where, who are God's people? What did his, what is his promise and how does it affect us? How do we fit into the picture? Um, the covenant. How do we fit into the covenant? What what deceptions are, are in place that have blinded us to understanding uh, who God is 
and what he has set down and who his people are and even the terms that we use. Where did those terms come from? How the enemy has hidden these things and wrapped them up in all of his little things, his celebrations and stuff and pulled Christians off of what God has set up where it says in the word, these are my feasts. Um, You know, so that's kind of what the book is about. Well, thank you, Diane, and thank you, Denny. And uh, please, if you would, Diane, uh, save all those questions and compile them. And then sometime, you know, when we do another show, we'll share all that Q&A so that you don't have to answer the same questions over and over, but we can put it out in a broadcast and then the, everybody can benefit from hearing um, the Q&A that people are um, sending to you. And also, do you want to give out your contact? Um, I guess it's just at your website, right? The repair. Yes. The breach. Well, it's okay. that one, but uh, it, the email is ISA5812 at wildblue.net. Yeah. Okay. If they want, you know, they can go to the website. Like I said, we are going to be redoing it because it's not, not cell phone friendly. You know how they've changed everything. Right, so right. Denny has to. Um, but there's a lot of the information is on there, and they can read a lot. And if they have any questions, they can just contact us with that email address. Well, I'm pretty certain that once this show goes out, that many people probably will contact you with certain questions, uh, or at least to just thank you for the work and the research that you've done. And so, um, again, you can find uh, Diane's book both in hard and softback at sacredwordpublishing.com and I'm guessing any timeline for when the next one will be available a year or so or how, how's that look uh, yeah well, I'm hoping to get it done by the end of this month maybe it'll be out in you know oh, the wow. end of this month or April it's close uh, uh, it's okay, close great. it's close. wonderful I just want to yeah and for people you know I just want to let them know that this is my last statement this one thing is important Skimming only gives you fuel for an argument. Reading gives you understanding. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Diana Denny. God bless everybody. Shalom. Shalom. Bless them. Good night. Listen to Revolution Radio at freedomsource.com. We'll be right back after this message.